All right, so when you come across a video like this, you're probably wondering why would this video exist? <laughs> um, and that's not really something I can answer. You're gonna have to ask the person that chose these two, um, which is him. So why did you choose these two as our next thing? I was flipping through movies on demand and these were free and I was like, oh yeah, these exist. Yeah, because with the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids video we just did, and what I'm gathering is the next video we're going to do, it kind of sounds like we're in a late 80s, early 90s, like. Yeah, we're, we're kind of there. We're in the no. late 80s, early 90s. All right, so uh, do we just start? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and start. I don't know how much comparing is going to be involved here, but <laughs> we'll just start with talking about the first movie and see where we end up. That works. That usually ends up, more comparisons usually end up happening than we expect when we start off that way. So that would just yeah. be. And sometimes we veer off into different theories and universes, and, and the fact that Hendrickson is just pissed that <laughs> Zelensky intruded on his, on his movie. All right, so I guess it is, I guess honestly the first thing I want to bring up is when you look at a movie like this that looks like the ultimate bad 90s comedy for families, I guess, <laughs> to some extent. Yeah, I would say it, so. That start off with, you know, a uh, baby pissing in someone's face joke is literally the first joke. Yeah. Um, you start to wonder what kind of directions you're going to go and what the quality is going to be, and your hopes are not very high. Mm -hmm. So you watch the opening credits, which it is kind of a funny opening credit sequence. The way you see like the quality of the homes they take him to keeps like going down. They get worse. <laughs> I I noticed that, and I also did enjoy the joke of they reused the basket until he wouldn't fit it in anymore. <laughs> And then even then, they still tried to stretch it. <laughs> and then there's the, the moment where, um, for some reason, he's in a house that's watching Boys Town. <laughs> and he's he straight up tells Spencer Tracy to go fuck it. So. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's how, that's how we begin the movie. Um, I think the, bu the bulldozer joke is funny, too, just for stepping on his toys. Yeah. That is really funny. But the thing that really catches my eye during the opening credit sequence is the writing credits. Do you recognize those guys' names? I don't think I was paying attention. They wrote some comedies, and this was like their starting off point, but they would go on to write Ed Wood, The People vs. Larry Flint, and Man on the Moon. What? Yeah. So biopics kind of eventually became the thing. I think they adapted 1408 as well. Are they trying to say that Junior grew up to be Andy Kaufman? Well, I don't know, because these guys also made their, I believe their directorial debut with something else that they wrote, and that was screwed. Oh. So the, these guys have the weirdest career I've maybe ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, if you want to talk about the stuff that they're capable of versus this movie that they made, apparently they were on Gilbert Gottfried's podcast once, and naturally these movies came up, go figure, because they wrote the sequel, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. And apparently the idea was somebody had read a story about an adopted family, adoptive family who wanted to return their child because he was, like, a hellion. Like, they could not control him whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood got a hold of this, and they decided they wanted to make a movie around it. And, of course most of them wanted to make a horror movie, like a bad sea kind of thing or a the good son kind of thing. <laughs> and then these guys got the idea of, well, why don't we make it a black comedy, but make it like really super dark and also do a satire on those, a child changes a family's life movies and just say fuck you to those movies. Mm -hmm. But then there were reshoots and studio involvement, and they eventually wanted to make it more family friendly. And much to the writer's dismay, eventually this movie popped out. <laughs> I want to see the black comedy. Yeah, apparently there were so many reshoots and so many rewritings. The birthday party scene. Yeah. 
is like a massive set piece in this movie. Mm -hmm. And it goes on for a long time. Mm -hmm. Apparently the entire birthday party was a reshoot. Jesus. Like that's how much was changed. (laughs) So I don't know what the, and I, like we were talking about off camera when you brought up the idea, the first thing I brought up was the Michael Richards uh, character. Mm-hmm. It's like it seems like an odd movie to have a murderer in it, <laughs> <laughs> like a straight up murderer. <laughs> yeah, and you can tell right there, these are two movies pressed together into one. <laughs> yeah, it's a Frankenstein movie. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, because like I think you could tell too, because some of Junior's pranks are very like kid oriented with her. <laughs> huh but some of the pranks that he does are very like child oriented like just throwing presents in the pool but some of the stuff he says you're like oh my god this kid could commit murder <laughs> like <laughs> i love how the punishments progress into you should beat him with the hairbrush too let's take him to a priest <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i'm not i'm not quite sure what that what exactly the objective was at the church? Because mm-hmm. it seems like they're taking him there to see a priest, but then Ben goes into the confessional, and then that's where the scene ends. So I don't know if it was for Ben's sake or if they were going to try to exercise him or what was going on here. And let, let's be real. The, the movie is about the kid, but the real driving force in these movies is John Ritter. Oh, yeah. I just realized real quick, I gotta fix my timeline. I think it was the baseball game that got him sent to the priest, wasn't it? And it was the... Uh, yeah, because they're still in the baseball uniforms, and that's when Ben's like, I've adopted Satan. So his his response to that is, well, if I've adopted Satan, I'll go to the church. <laughs> and then the, the hairbrush comes from the birthday party. Yeah. Which, there's, there's still an underlying theme because of his devil costume at the birthday party anyway, so they... They knew what they were doing regardless. Yeah, that that one hit the nail on the head pretty (laughs) hard. So I do find it interesting. You were talking about John Ritter. Do you want to go on that? I just had to correct myself real quick. (laughs) But no, like John Ritter is like the heart and soul of these movies. Like he's like, he's just super nice John Ritter. John Ritter is the only person that could play characters like this and it doesn't feel like it's done over and over again. Yeah. Like John Ritter plays the nice guy a lot, but he's just so damn likable you don't care. It's like John Candy. Yeah. Which <laughs> it's sad that the other thing they have in common is we both lo- lost both of them way too soon. Yeah, and I was just starting to have another image in my head of what this movie would be with John Candy. John Candy was still around too when this movie came out. Mhm. Now I'm wondering about him in it, but the great thing about this being in this type of movie is that John Ritter has had such uh, expertise in slapstick, which yeah. really came in handy. Yeah, John Ritter is very. It was very funny. Yeah, there was actually um, like there was a running joke where he has like a movement on Three's Company where he like trips forward. Mm-hmm. It was almost like a trademark. There is a video on YouTube of John Ritter on the dating game when he was still in college. Mm-hmm. And when he comes out, he does that bit. <laughs> it's like it, it goes back to before he was even famous. He was doing his routines. It's a shame that we never – I can't think of one. It's a shame we never got like a John Ritter, John Candy movie. I don't think we ever did, did we? As I, said, I have to think hard to make sure we didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think we did because you can only have one nice guy in a movie. <laughs> Now, could you imagine, like, some of their roles reversed? Like, John Candy is Ben Healy, so John Ritter becomes Uncle Buck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the same time, there's so, – I don't know. Uncle Buck is so, like, inherent to John Candy. It's kind of hard to imagine, but – John Candy great. does cast a big shadow. Like, even small roles. Like, could you imagine anybody else as the announcer in Rookie of the Year? No, not at all. No. <laughs> no, it's John Candy. Another movie that John Candy's hilarious in. Um, but, and it's funny too, like, I know we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but it's kind of funny how jarring the difference is in the way Ben's presented in the first one versus the second one. Yeah. <laughs> Cause in the first one, he's, he's son of dork. Like he's known 
as the town dork and then they move and he ends up being the dude that all the women want to date like it's very weird it's like somebody was like we shit on ben so much in the last movie let's throw him a bone in this one but not too big of a bone and and once again it must have been this it's uh, clearly the same people because the same dudes wrote both movies yeah. <laughs> So it's like it's almost like they felt bad for Ben Healy in the first one. They're like, let's make him like the most desirable guy in the world in the second one. But he still gets his Pratt falls and his his comedy moments too. In that one, and to kind of to kind of go with being the opposite of the ladies, man. It is worth noting that we just talked about dodgeball recently. Mm-hmm. How funny it is watching a married couple on screen where the woman is repulsed by the guy. Yeah. That's what we're doing here. This was before they were married. Like, this is before they were even together. Mm-hmm. Um, but still seeing that, knowing their future together, um, be- makes it automatically funnier. <laughs> yeah, and then in the, and then in the sequel, it's, it's, she gets to be nice. She's back. <laughs> but it's a di- completely different character that's unrelated. Which was an interesting choice. They must have really liked y- Amy Yazbek. Or, yeah. or John Ritter was like, the first movie... My my wife abused me. Now I want my wife to be kind to me. Yeah, I still wonder if there's there's no clear intentional joke. Mm-hmm. Like he never he never calls out that she looks like somebody familiar. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's an obvious joke, but like we don't we don't address it at all. We just treat it like a completely new person. But it's just yeah. funny in the first one, like. Like, you remember in basketball when the announcer's like, it certainly seems to be raining shit on Joe Cooper right now. That's Ben Healy in the first one. His dad hates him. His neighbor's a dick to him. His wife hates him. Junior's hell on wheels. It's like, it's like the shit on Ben Healy show. <laughs> and then there's another cast member we haven't addressed yet. There's a couple, but what are you thinking? Well... <laughs> It's interesting to look back on in retrospect. Now that I love movies the way that I do. Mm -hmm. Because you see, Jack Warden (laughs) had a really massive filmography. He was in 12 Angry Men. He was in Heaven Can Wait. He was in All the President's Men. He was in The Verdict. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the first time I ever saw Jack Warden was? (laughs) It was either Problem Child or Ed, if I had to guess. Oh my God. (laughs) it was it was these (laughs) why do i I feel why do i feel like if this was remade today jack warden's character would be played by bruce dern oh that'd be hilarious (laughs) because i love i think the the thing i love the most about jack warden's character is he Mm -hmm. the one that immediately knows there's something wrong yeah He's never met Junior before in his entire life. Mm-hmm. And the first time they meet, Ben opens the door and the fire's just there. <laughs> and Junior says, I was so scared. This is his first time meeting Junior. And the first thing he says is, he's lying. <laughs> it's like he, he just immediately knows. <laughs> That's funny. But then we get that weird scene. Some of the slapstick in this is so weird, and I don't. <laughs> I don't like he throw, he throws the cat in his face, and they go down the stairs. Yeah, and Jack Warren's being taken away on a stretcher. But even though they're just now taking Jack Warren away on a stretcher, the cat's arms are already in casts. Who did that so quickly? <laughs> the other paramedic, I'm guessing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love the I love the first shot we get in that scene as a cop pulling up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, so that was my introduction to two-time Academy Award nominee Jack Ward. But <laughs> Jack, but think, Jack Warden has a very interesting filmography as well. Yeah, especially, especially since he was so devoted to this, he's one of the few that's in all three movies. He's even in the he's even in the straight to video sequel. Really? Yeah. Does he play the same character? Yeah. <laughs> Do they just? Is it Ben Healy again? 
Yeah, I can't remember who the actor is, though. The the only other person I remember returning in the third movie that's still their actor is Murph, the big kid in the second one. Oh, that's right. I thought you were going to tell me Gilbert Godfrey came back again. No, I think he might be in three also. I was going to say, it'd be pretty weird if they were able to score Jack Warden, but uh, Gilbert Godfrey was just like, nah. Well, apparently what happened was Jack Warden initially wasn't going to do the movie, but De- I think Dennis Dugan was going to give him, like, part of his own paycheck or something because he wanted him that badly. Oh, my God. And so Dennis then, Dugan does the third one. <laughs> and when Warden was so, like, moved by that that he just went ahead and did it but didn't take his money. Oh, nice guy, Jack Warden. <laughs> He's definitely not nice guy, Big Ben Healy. Um, there's, there's one more character we haven't talked about that we should probably address. Who's that? We haven't talked about Michael Richards. Can I just say one thing real quick? Mm Mm-hmm. I love the idea, because we were talking about how jarring it is that a murderer is in this movie. Mm Mm-hmm. And I kind of love the way that the movie addresses that. (laughs) Particularly the pen pal scene. Yeah. When we get the voiceovers of the children writing and the girl says, Dear Queen Elizabeth, how is it being queen? And then the other kid says, like, um, Dear Bishop Tutu. Bishop Tutu is, like, a Nobel Peace Prize winning, like, human rights activist. Mm -hmm. And the kid's like, how's the marching going? And then it just pans over to Junior. Dear Bowtie Killer. (laughs) 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 And I think his question is, how's prison? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I love I love that he th- <laughs> I love that Richards thinks he's a convict named J.R. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And he, a, and he stalls he, joke. <laughs> I know and, and the fact that it's Michael Richards of course he sells it so well <laughs> Oh my god when he's when he's so sinister in the broken doorway, I'm looking for jail. <laughs> I think what cracks me up too, and I noticed this when I when I watched it, John Ritter's character probably would have picked up on something, but he shows up when John Ritter's character is already mentally gone. <laughs> <laughs> this scene that's and I wonder, I wonder if this was intentional on Scorsese's part. Scorsese. Yep. I just okay. yes, we're going in Scorsese territory talking about problems, John. You may remember a scene at the beginning of Cape Fear <laughs> when Nick Nolte and Jessica Lang and Juliet Lewis are at the movie theater and the scene is De Niro comes in and sits in front of them and starts laughing maniacally while smoking a cigar and drives them out. Mm-hmm. And it's his way of subtly or not so subtly terrorizing them. The movie they're watching in the theater is Problem Child, <laughs> and it's and it's the scene that. it's the scene after Richards has kidnapped them, and Ben's going around the house insane, saying goodbye and throwing their stuff out the window. Yeah, it's like was it intentional on Scorsese's part to choose a comedy where a killer has invaded a family's life? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> the fact I really that, thought about that. The fact that Scorsese would incorporate, and he must have known about Problem Child right there because Cape Fear only came out the next year. Maybe we're in a Terrence Malick situation and and Problem Child's like a top five Scorsese flick. Oh my God, I hope so. (laughs) Uh. (laughs) And I I love in that scene too, have you noticed the joke that... um, after John Ritter's lost it, he has the home sweet home pillow that he goes to smother Junior. He carries that around the rest of the day. Yeah. <laughs> it's so many. That's another one of those jokes that's great because it keeps going because it's funny enough that he's ready to smother it. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, when he, the fact that he carries it around the whole time is hilarious. He, he has it at the dinner table. like. <laughs> oh. Mm. So. 
I want to, I want to be, I want to be, I want to see the person that came up with that idea. Cause that's just hilarious. <laughs> Like, I, wa- I want it to be a case where he, do- he like it goes away, but somebody's like, well, what if he keeps carrying around that pillow? <laughs> like, ready to smother at a moment's notice. <laughs> uh, also worth noting when he starts going catatonic, there's the whole thing where he's reading like self-help parenting books the whole movie. And uh, then and it- <laughs> he's reading The Exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> And I love how, like, I love how short-lived his new plan is. <laughs> that it's like he literally leaves Gilbert Gottfried's office, saying, "We're gonna love him no matter what." And then we have that car scene, and then he's already back, and then he's just resorted to murder. Like taking him back is no longer an option. Now it's murder. <laughs> it just, it, like, it's the Ron Burgundy gift that escalated quickly. <laughs> this is where it benefits from. <laughs> Oh, you cut out there. What's it benefit from? It cut out there. What were you saying? What was the benefit? This is where it benefits from the short run time. Yeah. <laughs> because things can jump to that so point quickly. so quickly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, another note on Michael Richards. Mm-hmm. For starters, we were talk- We were joking about smiley pies a little bit ago. Mm-hmm. You gotta love that... Um, when he stuffs the whole thing in his mouth and then sees the cop and spits it out. For a split second, he went full Kramer. (laughs) (laughs) And and there's, remember, there was even a storyline where Kramer was mistaken for a murderer. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) But yes. It always always bugged me as a kid and it bugs me now as an adult. When he bites the wrapper, does he eat some of the plastic? Yeah, last time I watched, I looked just to be sure. He just bites right into it. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I kept waiting for a moment where he spits it out and then eats it, but no, he just keeps going. <laughs> and I think when he has his moment, he spits out the smiley pie. I think the pie comes out, but I never saw the plastic. <laughs> so um, another thing about his character that probably won't surprise you at all. Hmm. We were, even though this came first, um, we were making comparisons to that storyline with uh, Switchblade Sam and Dennis the Menace. Mm-hmm. Apparently it was meant to be because I guess Christopher Lloyd was actually supposed to play Beck. Or they they had intended him to play Beck, but the thing that held him back was Back to the Future 3 was still going on. Uh-huh. Or he would have. And so oh, I don't man, know. You, you, w- you wouldn't have got your bar scene. <laughs> <laughs> your bar scene from Back to the Future 3 that you love so much. So... What is it with these kids' movies from the early 90s that really wanted to make Christopher Lloyd, make children scared of Christopher Lloyd? Because might as well throw Judge Doom into this. <laughs> yeah. That, would, that was just the, what, two years before this. That's probably why they wanted to cast him. Probably. My, my burning question is, is how close, because I'm not, I'm not good with years. How close was the Bowtie Killer to Stanley Spadowski? I think just one wasn't UHF just the year before this. What year was this? Ninety. Okay, yeah, it was eighty nine because they. I remember them comparing its box office to Batman, which wasn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he's just rolled off of Stanley Spadowski. Yeah, and now we're here. Yeah, because people people say that about him. How once he played Kramer, they didn't see much range in him. Mm-hmm. Because I think that's, that's only because everybody just wanted to see Kramer. Yeah. But he's, there's a lot Michael Richards can do. He was, I mean, there's, I mean, there's so much to do in the Kramer character itself, but mm-hmm. I, think, I, think, I think we even kind of touched on this when we talked about UHF, so. <laughs> yeah. So we've come full circle. Mm-hmm. But uh, the ending is another area where it escalates quickly. When it turns into octopusy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's like the short car chase Ben gets shot <laughs> and that happens he he pulls the gun out with like 30 seconds of the movie left <laughs> <laughs> I believe if I remember correctly which I should because I just watched it yesterday once we find out Ben's not going to die the credits just roll yeah we, we, get the, we get the final payoff that Flo is going to God knows where <laughs> 
<laughs> I, lo- I love the fact that they just like they just don't bother to get her. <laughs> like they're like, well, she's gone. Okay. And we never do find out her fate. All we find out in the sequel is that Ben is single. We don't know how or why. <laughs> so now that we've touched on all that. What do you think about the aspects that I normally hate in movies like this? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to throw a fan theory out there because I just figured something out. (laughs) I was trying to figure out why Ben had so much money in the sequel, and I think I know what it is. I think this is going to get kind of dark. I think they just let Flo go and presumed her dead, and Ben collected the life insurance. (laughs) Cause isn't it kind of jarring how he's so like in in the first one his <laughs> bank account is cleaned out by his dad, and then in the second one he's just he's pretty loaded. <laughs> that is that is a pretty big house. Yeah. <laughs> he had to get that with flow life insurance money. But um, what were you wanting to talk about? Sorry, oh, no. I thought of that and I didn't want to lose that thought. Yeah, well, because uh, it's it's boring to say lazy writing. It's better to come up with stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the stuff I usually hate in movies like this that go super over the top, have stupid scenes like the cat on Jack Warden's face, mm-hmm. stuff like that, um, eventually get sentimental. But as you pointed out, the great thing about this movie is, I, that's maybe a stretch, but What's, what's, what this movie does is <laughs> it has the sentimental moment that's very short-lived because of the car scene. Yeah. But we do have these moments that try to be genuinely heartwarming. And usually in movies like this, they fail. But we do have the moment where he's, you know, he talk, where Gilbert Gottfried says he's been returned 30 times. And we see some, like, genuine emotion in Ben where he's, like, really taken aback by that. Mm-hmm. Even though we can tell why. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, like, how devoted Ben is to giving him love when he's the kid that deserves it the least. Because we don't know why Junior's like this. He just is. Yeah, and, and it's nice, too, because they kind of, there's a decent payoff to it, too. It's during Ben's little maniacal run through the, through the house and he finds the pictures in the drawer and he's the only one that's drawn normal and he's just waving and smiling. Like, that's a nice payoff to Ben's effort. Yeah, and the moment, the moment I was telling you about or that I hinted at that I actually kind of like is how it's actually kind of subtle it, for this movie. For this movie, it's kind of subtle. <laughs> I was gonna say we gotta we gotta grade on a curve here. <laughs> the way he's like when he starts warming up to Ben, because mm-hmm. it's not really much of a dramatic turn like that. It starts off with him almost making fun of him. Yeah. When he says, "What is this guy nice or something?" Yeah. But it's that moment. Honestly, the real turning point to me feels like at the baseball game. Mm-hmm when the son of dork chant starts and he like straight up defends him to the catcher. Like he gets it's, really it's, pissed off. He gets yeah, pissed it's the off. First time, it's the first time that he's taken it upon himself to get angry on somebody else's behalf. <laughs> <laughs> and then in his junior way, he just takes it too, too far. And that actually transitions pretty seamlessly into the church scene when he's genuinely hurt that Ben wants to take him back. Yeah. So there's, they had something here. John Ritter and 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 Junior, John Ritter and Junior do have some nice moments. Like at the birthday party that you brought up earlier when Ben walks up and he's just like, hey, it's tough being left out. There's a lot of really nice scenes with John Ritter. And I think it's the fact that it's John Ritter that makes it work. And the way he says it, it sucks to be left out says so much about Ben's character at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's a, it's a surprisingly kind of, I won't say deep, but we go a little bit below the surface. Which now brings me back to what the hell was already there if the birthday party was a reshoot? <laughs> Mass murder, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Something apparently dark, to my understanding. 
And it's funny, like, I never realized this. I, uh, Susan watched this one with me. And at the birthday party scene, she was like, how has no one stopped him from throwing all those presents in the pool? <laughs> and then I thought about it. And I was like, how did the parents not realize that there were firecrackers in the cake? <laughs> like, <laughs> There's so many things, especially in the second one. There's so many things where you're either going to run with it or you're not. Yeah, second, you, have to, you have to have a certain suspension of disbelief. Yeah, because the second one does not give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's pure over-the-top slapstick. Like, the first one, you could tell there was some hints of darkness where it might have been something else before. The second one's just straight family comedy with hell-raising kids. And gr- There's a lot more gross-out gags. And, I mean, you also have to remember, too, Problem Child came out, Problem Child 2 came out after everyone realized that Home Alone was popular. Yeah. So there's a lot of more, like, like, we're in the first one, it's just Junior doing evil things, and the second one, it's more like, well, as Data would put it, setting booty traps. Thanks a lot, John Hughes. Look what you did. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and of course, of course, a sequel was inevitable because, like we were saying, the writers were not confident in the movie, and it was turned into an abomination that they did not think of whatsoever, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Then the movie went on to make $72 million, which in 1990 is a shitload of money. <laughs> yeah, it did really well. And the sequel, if I remember correctly, did not even make half of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just realized something. I just realized something. Uh, this is the second movie in a row Michael Richards did where a character in power is trying to get his way and is filmed doing something that he wouldn't want seen. <laughs> there is I love how yeah. resort, and I don't know why this cracked me up. I know I kind of detoured you off your point there, but with the scene where Jack Warden's like talking to the recording, I love that he goes so far as to moon him. And for some reason, the camera is really close. <laughs> and his boxers are like American flag. Like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> but it's funny because they do kind of play off of that in the second one because, like, in the second one, he's bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they actually felt the need to carry over some story points. <laughs> yeah. And they, um, they got a raise in their rating for the sequel as well. Which is funny because it seems like the sequel kind of tones it down a little bit. But, I mean, there is a lot of gross-out humor. So I I know one scene in particular that you probably just, when it was on, you probably just left the room. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And it it is funny to make the comparison when you see a, a series, I guess, go from PG and they graduate to PG-13. Mm-hmm. So it's like going from Problem Child to Problem Child 2, according to the MPAA, is the same thing as going from Prisoner of Azkaban to the Goblet of Fire. <laughs> <laughs> Quality-wise, not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, we can pretty much assume that um, we can all agree that Problem Child 2 is not very good, right? Right. Like to be Like, to be nice to it, we'll say it's not very good. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it, it, it definitely shows why the the next sequel was straight to video, and John Ritter was like, "Yeah, no." <laughs> <laughs> like even John Ritter had had enough. Yeah, he he would have rather have been in a Chucky movie. Apparently, is what we learned. <laughs> it's one of the few movies where John Ritter's not a nice guy. Yeah, <laughs> and he even pulls that off well. <laughs> so, John, John Ritter's like a painter, like. When he was alive, people liked his work. I'm going somewhere. People, <laughs> people liked his work, but now that he's passed, you look back on it and you see just how much more talented he was, and you're like, damn it, why didn't I appreciate it then? Yeah. <laughs> see, I told you John Ritter was like a painter. <laughs> well, luck- luckily, I do still I, think there's... I, I, will also, I will always, always love Bob Chapeska. Yeah. <laughs> what, what a note to go out on. <laughs> I know, it's great. Like a lot of actors, like you're like, you're sad that's their last movie. But with Ritter, I'm perfectly fine 
with his final on-screen turn being Bob Chapeska because it's perfect. <laughs> John Ritter's absolutely perfect there. <laughs> so now we'll be able to touch on some of the stuff that you hinted at before, mm -hmm. starting with us being post Home Alone, which I hadn't even thought about, mm -hmm. and going as over the top as possible. Like that—that's already a sequel thing in general. But you t you put that on top of we're post Home Alone now. Yeah, and it's like. Like, we get this moment with the grill is the first time I think we really go. Because like you can, you kind of imagine, you think you know what you're in for with this grill bit. Mm -hmm. Where the fire is going to be too big. The guy might have the black on his face or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but no, this grill bit goes full Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I can't tell if I admire it for that or not. <laughs> I just love how a lot of the jokes are at the expense of this guy. <laughs> he's the one that drinks the lemonade pitcher of piss that that lemonade scene is so bizarre <laughs> with, the, such a with weird the twins thing. from kindergarten cop yeah do it doing the same joke where they talk at the same time is that <laughs> yeah i never thought about that but that's true but the way they do it where it's like we get cut of like it almost looks like we're looking at a nature commercial over the sound of him pissing into the pitcher. Yeah, and it that is goes weird. on. It goes on forever. And you would think the payoff of it going forever would be that he's filling the whole pitcher impossibly. Yeah. But he only fills it halfway and they make it a point to draw attention to that. Yeah. There are so many things where I'm not sure what the weirdest thing about this scene is. And apparently the least weird thing is that a guy drinks piss. <laughs> what does that say about how weird this scene is? Yeah. It's, a, it's weird. It's so fucking weird. But, I mean, there, there's also some parts that I did kind of chuckle at. Like, I think it's funny later when the girls are selling stuff and Jack Warden stops by and it ends up being all of Jack Warden stuff. And they're like, yeah, Junior sold us all this for like 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> like that that's funny there's also the once again this when we're talking about this movie subtle has a different definition yeah but there's a nice joke i like in this that's a background joke and it gets three separate payoffs there's isn't like three great, separate isn't parts. it great when like background jokes work yeah like background <laughs> jokes are, can be a lot of fun because it starts off with him, with Jack Warren talking about his little starter packs. Yeah. And he says, uh, and then he, Junior says, um, what kind of video would send Grandpa money? And then later on it's revealed that the crazy ex-husband that's played by Edward Norton's boss in Fight Club is the guy that bought it. Yeah, one of, the bankers, one of the bankers in Tommy Boy. Yeah. <laughs> I can never, I see that dude everywhere and I do not know his name. Zach Grenier, it's his name, okay. I believe. <laughs> okay. And so, but then there's another payoff where it's like, who would send him money? Who would be stupid enough to do that? And then a few scenes later, we see the starter back in the background of that guy's house. Mm -hmm. But then there's one more payoff where Jack Warren just says in passing, I only sold one. So <laughs> that guy <laughs> was the only one. <laughs> Yeah, I never noticed that until I did the most recent rewatch that the Ben Healy pack was hanging out back there. <laughs> <laughs> and then we talk about the change in Ben's character, which we've touched on. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that... not really it's not really a change in his character. I don't think Ben's different. He's just portrayed differently. Uh, yeah, this goes this goes into the Lorraine Newman character, mm -hmm. who I think is pretty wasted. Because they don't really, once she goes full villainous, which is pretty early, they don't really give her much else funny to do. Like, funny, in quotes, situations happen to her, like the plastic surgery and the rabies. Mm -hmm. But the only time she's ever really given anything funny to say or do is when she's addressing Ben in these really over-the-top ways. Mm -hmm. Like when she sees him the first time she sees him and she's like, Oh my god, who is that beefcake? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then my personal favorite, when she opens his file and just sees his picture there and she's like, Oh my god, he's an Adonis. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no, not not 
what's weird about her character too is they they explain that she's had multiple husbands, but we don't understand why. And Unless I miss something. No, they're they're just all John Ritter in different costumes when we see the pictures. Oh, that's right. <laughs> And I love the way, um, I do like, I talk about how some of the jokes build on themselves, because I think the biggest problem with the movie's jokes, apart from how much they rely on gross out that doesn't work, mm -hmm. is that there's not enough anticipation in them. Yeah. It's always like, it's trying to cut straight to the punchlines every time. Mm -hmm. Where like, we get, like the whole thing with the ex-husband when he calls him up and says they're at this restaurant, there is no buildup. He just shows, it just cuts to him showing up at the restaurant. Yeah. And there's no time for us to kind of build that. I wonder what's going to happen kind of already pre laughter sort of thing, just thinking about what could happen and then what the ultimate payoff is. That is non-existent in this movie. <laughs> yeah. And you even, you even get the moment where there's a whole montage devoted to the doorbell electrocuting the woman. Mm -hmm. And it's like that. We get a whole montage for a joke that lasts for like ten seconds. Yeah. And this and this isn't a Tarantino movie. Building up for ten seconds of the payoff doesn't work as well. Mm. <laughs> when you're talking about stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But there I do is, love there the way some. Thing, of... there, there is one thing this movie did though that I that I have to tip my cap to. I have never seen a movie. Where James Tolkien has played a character like that. <laughs> he's, he's always like being super authoritative. Yeah, so it's weird to like, like what, but at the same time, they do stuff with him that doesn't make sense. Like when they do the parents' night, why is he in a diaper? I mean, it's. <laughs> well, I can't. I can't tell what your question is because obviously it's a payoff to the toilet exploding joke, but, mm -hmm. but it's, <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't know if that's like a medical thing he needs to be doing now or what that is, but mm -hmm. yeah, but I'm more so like more so the stuff that pays off is just like line deliveries. Yeah. Cause like I said, you get Lorraine Newman's lines. I love the moment where, um, the ex-husband thing at the restaurant just happened. Then the babysitter thing happens. Then Jack Warden shows up. And when Jack Warden's... This is all in one night. Mm -hmm. And so when Jack Warden rings the doorbell, Ben answers it going, the evening that wouldn't die. <laughs> <laughs> it's like stuff, stuff like that is so much funnier than all of the big stuff they're going for. Yeah. So, yeah. But once again, how much of that comes down to John Ritter's delivery? Yeah, and that, but but there is there is one joke that they did right where they went in the opposite direction you expect them to because all the jokes try to go so big. Mm -hmm. The one joke that I think actually it seems like a dead end of a joke, but I think it just works for me because of how much it plays on expectations given what the movie's done up to this point. Mm -hmm. And that's hypnotizing the dog. Yeah, because it's like. Oh, what's he gonna do with the dog? Because he built it up. He's like, oh, if I can't do something about it, the dog can. And so he goes to hypnotize the dog, and it's like, oh, so that's that's like really dumb and really lazy comedy writing. He's gonna hypnotize the dog to do whatever he wants, and the dog is gonna run rampant or whatever. And the dog just freezes into a statue instead. <laughs> <laughs> and and going further with that, the way that the dog is no longer a statue is really bizarre. Yeah, I wanted to dissect that with you. <laughs> okay. What the hell is that scene? <laughs> what is that no scene? I have no clue. The whole scene feels like a commercial from UHF. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, what the hell is it doing here? <laughs> and, it, and where it shows up? Like, what? Okay, okay, let's break it down. Let's start off with the first joke in this scene, which makes absolutely no sense. Which is? The guys show up, and they're like, hey, we hear there's, like, rabid animals on the loose, which has never been alluded to before. Yeah. And so 
they do the thing where the guy goes to touch the other guy sensually. I missed the that. Has, the other guy has to bat him away. You missed that? Yeah, I must have, yeah. like, I must have got distracted by something. I missed that. Yeah, there's, like, a weird gay joke in there for, like, a fraction of a second. It's weird. And it's never touched on again. And then they bring out the whole chow down cans, which we see the ex-husband eating earlier. So it's, it is interesting that it was a preluded to scene. It's like, it's like Tarantino's red apple cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's like, oh, so they're not rabies guys. They're actually do- like dog food salesmen, I think. But then no, they're actually rabies guys because we have the blood joke. And how did Junior replace the blood and when? What is all this? How did the the scientists not realize that the label was clearly written on by a child? (laughs) What is is that whole five minutes? (laughs) (laughs) I almost, once again, I almost want to admire it for being almost surreal. It's like like the intermission and the meaning of life. Like what? And it gets even weirder, like, for some reason, Lorraine Newman's character, I'm assuming, gets arrested for having rabies. <laughs> but then, but, but they just let her go to get plastic surgery? I don't... Yeah. I don't, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> that, 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 okay. Like, the last, the last third of this movie is like a freaking fever dream. Yeah, important question. Is that what they wanted? I don't know. <laughs> because I don't get it. <laughs> I kind of wish the, like, at the same time, a lot of it doesn't work. But at the same time, I think I would have appreciated the movie more if all of it was just, like, a fever dream like that. <laughs> yeah, if they, if they just went, if they just, because it looks like, as is, they're making this really gross-out, drawn-out comedy. And then by the time they got to the third act, they just did not care. They wanted to they wanted to see what they could get away with because the other movie made so much money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They wanted to see just how much they could put into this and just get away with. <laughs> yeah. Because then you get to the because then there's the whole dog shit joke where when he eats chow down, he shits this fucking eye. Yeah. And for some reason that was a joke that split their side so much. They brought it back to be the final joke. They, the final returning payoff running joke in the movie right before the credits roll. Which this movie, well, like the first one, like just kind of ends. Yeah. <laughs> like they go to walk off, roll credits. And he redoes the cake gag from the birthday party, but the cake flies now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we were talking about the chow down scenes. Like, what the hell is that five minutes? What is the last ten seconds of this movie? <laughs> I do I do like how, like, they kind of address, like, the whole movie, like, like, uh, Jack Warden wants John Ritter to marry this woman. And then at the end, John Ritter's like, if you want it so bad, you do it. Jack Warden's just like, all right, that's a good idea. Yeah, and why, did, <laughs> why didn't he start with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a weird ass movie. Like I never, I never picked up on that as a kid, but watching it now, what a fucking weird movie. <laughs> like, like Jack Warden's first like slapstick scene. Like he goes to like attack Junior, and Junior ducks, and he flies out the window and is stuck in a tree. <laughs> I do love. That's another line delivery I love. How um, Jack Warden's little catchphrase throughout the movies is whatever somebody just said, my ass. Hmm. Did you notice right before he jumps out the window, Junior's making like his little like ninja noises when he's doing the nunchucks, and Jack Ward says, "Ho ho ho, my ass." <laughs> <laughs> I did notice that. <laughs> oh my god! I don't know what else can possibly be said. <laughs> and I and I love how I love how Big Ben in this one finds himself to be such a threat, but he's not. Because, like, there's a scene when Junior and Trixie are there, and he just wakes up. And Junior's just like, oh, great, Big Ben's up. 
so yeah is that I, what we... I i still don't understand how the shift in view of ben healy just comes from the fact that they say that the city is like the divorce capital of the world <laughs> or something like that that's the closest they could get to covering that girl <laughs> yeah and here I am just thinking there's a, even though this is like 10 years before that movie came out, probably 12 years, in my head I'm thinking Mortville, I want to pay off where Mort Rainey's the mayor. Oh, God. <laughs> but that's, that's the thing, too, is between that and the humor of Lorraine Newman's lines describing him, it sounds like we're just bagging on John Ritter's looks. Which, <laughs> which no, he was like, you know, not a bad looking dude. It's just the way his character is set up to be like the dorkiest dude of all time. <laughs> I know their very first scene when they're driving to the new town together, they're wearing matching clothes. Well, is that our connection is terrible in this video. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, when they're moving to the new town in the very first scene when they're driving the truck, they're wearing the same clothes. <laughs> <laughs> but um. Yeah, the, the thing, the thing I was saying, I don't know if it was cut off, was uh, we're not bagging on John Ritter's looks because he wasn't—he wasn't a bad-looking dude. It's just that Ben Healy is set up to be the dorkiest dude in the world. <laughs> but then again, I mean, that new town they went to was pretty far away. He probably was able to escape that reputation. <laughs> yeah, because when she. Because when she opens it and we see that young picture of John Ritter, that is that's what he looked like on the dating game. Mm -hmm. He he looks like Jason. <laughs> like their their resemblance. Of, I know they're father and son, but the resemblance when you see young John Ritter is almost eerie. <laughs> huh. That's interesting. Um, but I mean, yeah, there is a lot about the second one that doesn't work. The the. Uh, girl that's trying to be like junior just doesn't really the, work the food fight yeah, scene at the pizza place that for some reason gilbert gottfried's at <laughs> i mean i i can appreciate that as a joke but <laughs> and the fact that the fact that he has the sixth grade stamp on hand <laughs> <laughs> And the fact that all Junior has to do is hand James Tolkien a card with that stamp, and James T James Tolkien's like, "Okay, go find a seat." <laughs> <laughs> he's so he's that's what you were saying. He's so the opposite of his characters on like in Back to the Future or in Fresh Prince, where it's like he's so past and Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a the second one is a movie where. They try to feature and really go for the over-the-top jokes, but some of the little shit between the lines is what's funny. Yeah. Like the sixth grade stamp and <laughs> like little stuff like that. All right. Is that our conclusion? <laughs> I, I think so. It's <laughs> These two movies are definitely movies that there, there, are the, there are the jokes that they want you to see, but all the funny stuff is between the lines. And I think you could say that for both movies. That sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, <laughs> I, I would say a big part of why these movies, were, I don't know how successful the second one was, uh, but the first, I mean, John Ritter's the heart and soul of the movies. Yeah, the movie is about Junior and all the hell he causes, but it's John Ritter that really drives it and his committal to it. And John Ritter's committal to, you know, he's not, he wasn't afraid to make himself look like a dork or a spaz or anything like that. As far as success monetarily, I think it was the first one was 72 million, and I think this one made only like 30 something million. No, oh, so people wise that pretty quick. That was probably that was probably word of mouth probably has something to do with that. <laughs> yeah, and then it I mean, stole I don't know the, and then it stole a joke from the Sandlot. The joke that you hate. It stole a joke from the Sandlot before the Sandlot came out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well then the Sandlot did it better. Because <clears throat> I think I want to say the Sandlot was ninety three, and I think this was ninety one. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah the that's another thing too. Is, is it, came, it came out literally the next year, so it was another one of those kind of rushed sequels. It shows too. <laughs> it definitely shows. It was like it was like somebody like realized the success of the first one and then came to the table and they're like, "What if there was a second child like that?" <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a perfect summation for these movies. What they want you to see isn't as good as the stuff between the cracks. <laughs> All right. Then I guess that should wrap this up, and I think we know what we're doing next. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to uh, shell out some time for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and like I said, John John Ritter is just like a painter, you know, like Da Vinci or, you know, Michelangelo, you know, painters like that. All right. I, be I, I better watch putting this little wooden table away. I might get a splinter. <laughs> oh, rats. That would suck. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you haven't guessed the next movie is Pocahontas <laughs> <laughs> no no um, but I think we're going to try to continue to stick to Wednesdays and Fridays uh, for the video schedule um, you're still doing some King videos right yeah I'll be shooting one right after this actually <laughs> oh okay perfect oh, and then I've got a review video. A review video should be out after this if I can mm -hmm. squeeze them all in and shoot them at the very last minute. But they'll be there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then I guess uh, that's pretty much it for this, isn't it? Yeah, I would say so. All right. 